Hello, Celebration Church. I'm Pastor Allen, and I wish to bring you an update regarding our church during the during this COVID-19 pandemic. I pray that this update finds you safe and sound, and I hope that you and your family are doing well. We are all learning new things about ourselves and our work and our world during this time. And on the church front, we are also learning new things as well. Since suspending all of our in-person meetings and gatherings, we have found new ways to connect and to care for one another and to continue being the church. This past week, our session met, and after prayer and discussion, we decided to extend the current suspension of all our in-person worship services, church programs and activities until further notice. Now, previously, we had suspended all activities until after April 12th. But right now, we're simply extending this suspension indefinitely. There really isn't a good reason to fix a firm date, given the ever-changing situation of the virus outbreak. But rest assured, our session members will actively monitor the situation and will base our decision to resume normal gatherings when it is deemed safe to do so by our government and medical authorities. So until further notice, all in-person Celebration Church meetings and gatherings have been suspended. We wish to encourage all of our members and adherents to do our part in following the directives of our Canadian health care experts to continue safeguarding the well-being of everyone in our local community by staying at home, venturing out only when absolutely necessary, and practicing physical and social distancing. And of course, remembering to wash your hands when you return home. Now during this time, when we cannot gather and meet in person, we will however do everything we can to carry on being the church. And to that end, we have set up in place a weekly worship and sermon on video that you can access on our church website, which is celebrationpc.com, or on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our own channel and receive new postings on our website. Weekly, both Pastor James and I will be blogging to help keep all of us thinking and reflecting on God on what God is saying to us during this unprecedented crisis that we're facing. And weekly, all of you are invited to our Sunday morning prayer meeting, 10 a.m. to connect and to pray via Zoom meeting. You will find a Zoom link to join this prayer meeting in our weekly mail out. Weekly, all of our men's and women's high school and young adult fellowships are all checking in and meeting via Zoom. Uh, so look for the invitations to join these online meetings in your email, as well all of our small groups. Uh, I'm speaking of Central and Eat, Seek, Love, Lounging with the Lord and Good Shepherd, including Messy Church, are also meeting. So contact your group leader and find out when uh, your Zoom meetings are taking place. At this point, let me say a special word about Right Now Media. Right Now Media is a Christian video library resource, kind of like um, a Christian Netflix that our church has subscribed to. And we want to give this as a free gift to every person and family in our congregation. We wish to make this video streaming resource something you could uh, use while staying at home. All of you have received our church uh, electronic mailouts. All of you who have received that mailout have been invited to register online and to get your own free access to Right Now Media. Through Right Now Media, you can view over 20,000 videos that are available. Anything from Bible studies to Christian speakers, sermons, conferences, uh, a lot of children's videos, and just about any Christian topic you can think of. There's a search function which you can use to search up interested topics. And as well, on uh, a weekly basis, I will be directing 
uh, you to some recommended videos that will complement what Pastor James and I will be teaching and speaking on. So, please, if you haven't done so already, please take a few moments to sign up for Right Now Media. If you can't find the invitation that I had sent out to you previously, please contact me with your preferred email and I will get that link out to you as soon as possible. Finally, I wish to inform you of a new outreach initiative that our session recently put forward. As you know, with the coronavirus outbreak, many local GTA services that serve the homeless and needy had to close their doors. One organization that Celebration Church has partnered with, Evangel Hall, also had to close its doors. However, they have made a special appeal to our church to see whether we could help them out by donating $10 grocery gift cards, grocery store gift cards. This way, Evangel Hall could uh, continue to serve their clients, those who are most needy, uh, by giving them these grocery store gift cards to meet their daily needs. So. I think it's a wonderful way for Celebration Church to continue being active to serve those in our downtown community. So I invite you to go to our church website, which is celebrationpc.com. Once again, find the Give tab and give generously, whatever amount you wish, so that as a church, we can stay active as a church, not just in meeting to um, take care of ourselves and each other, but also to reach out with the love of Christ to those most impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. I hope to stay in touch with you through our weekly electronic mail-out and also through my phone. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me confidentially, if necessary, about any needs that you or someone you know may have. And our church will do whatever we can to help and to meet that specific need, specific need. So may God bless you, and let's keep in touch. Take care. Yeah.
Good morning, Celebration Church. I hope the Lord keeps you well this beautiful morning and that you are enjoying some of this uh, social distancing season to be at home and maybe some of us are catching some time to relax, uh, to to rest. Some of us may be very restless over these last couple of weeks, but I hope that today's message and, and, and His Word today may challenge and to bless and, and move your hearts today. Uh, some of you are watching from the comfort of your sofa on your big screen TVs or some of you might be watching from your computers, your tablets, or your phones. Uh, but regardless, I hope that you will listen in today and that uh, you would really think about this word today as we begin uh, Passion Week. And uh, for those of you who uh, may have may have forgotten uh, that we are still in the midst of the Lent season. We are about a week away from Easter. And that today's word uh, begins to sort of focus us back on that journey, on that road of, of remembering and recalling the stories and, and the narratives of, of Jesus' life on earth. And so today, as we think about Jesus, as we think about the cross, that we we'll also take time to reflect inwards and, and to think, you know, how is God uh, moving in my life today and how has he uh, done things in my life in the past, and even to think about how is God moving me today into the future as well. And so uh, today, let's let's begin with a word of prayer, and I hope that uh, the Lord may speak to you in today's message. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for gathering us here. Um, it may be a, dis a distance apart, Lord. We may be um, across cities from each other. Uh, some may be um, even further than just a city away. But Lord, we pray uh, that this morning, that as we hear your word, uh, that you would speak into our hearts, that you would speak into our lives, O oh God. And Lord, that you would transform us, that you would change us, that we would not remain the same again. But Lord, that as we... Uh, partake in, in this Lent season as we think about Holy Week that is coming up. Lord Father, that we may draw nearer to you. That if we've been fixing our eyes on COVID-19 and this coronavirus pandemic, and we've been maybe scared or in fear, Lord Father, would you put peace on our hearts instead? That rather than looking at the things that make us fearful and that cause us to lament each day, Lord Father, we would also think about the pain that you endured on the cross. That no matter our fear, and no matter how fearful things are, Lord Father, Lord, we know that you are with us. And so, Lord, help us to lean on you today. Know that you are authority over all things, even the troubles here on earth. And Lord, that we put everything in your hands. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Mark chapter 11, verses 1 to 11. 
Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now there are a number of different characters we see in this passage. Um, maybe the first one isn't even a human. Uh, the first one is the cult. And for many of us, we don't really think about the cult and the situation. We just think about the situation of Jesus coming down uh, the, the streets of Jerusalem. But the very first thing that Jesus commands his, his two, these two disciples is he tells them to go into the village and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied. Now, I don't know how Jesus would know this type of thing. You know, he's very specific about what kind of colt it is. In fact, he says, you will find a colt which no one has ever ever sat. He tells them to untie it and bring it. And then he also gives them instruction to say to the people who are caring for this colt, if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord has need of it and we'll send it back here immediately. Now, here's a question. Who are you expecting Jesus to be? You know, the two disciples are asked to do something awkward and very precarious. And this all has to do with who they expect Jesus to be. It was sudden and probably wondered, why? Why a cult? And so the two disciples, as they're going, they're probably thinking to themselves, why, why a cult? Okay, but we're going to go anyway. <laughs> and we're going to obey God. We're going to obey Jesus. We're going to go get this cult if he says it's there, we'll, we'll believe him. And so they're putting their faith in, in Jesus, whom they've been following for, for many, many, many weeks now. You know, this, this kind of situation may be very, very awkward for them. Imagine asking, or not even asking, just untying it and then just taking it away and explaining to somebody why you're taking it away. And that's exactly what happen you know imagine somebody coming up to you and, and maybe uh just kind of coming into your home and opening up your door and find the keys to your car and then letting you know hey uh, i'm gonna borrow your car and i'm gonna take off with it I'll, I'll return it immediately just gonna just gonna drive down the street i gotta drive someone just down the street and then i'm gonna bring it back to you now i'm not sure about you i'd probably call the cops right away but for these two disciples this is what they pretty much did. Imagine two strangers that you've never met in your life coming and saying, I'm going to take this colt. I'm going to untie them. I'm going to take him. I'm going to carry somebody down, down this street, and then I'm going to return to you right away. I'm not sure if I would be so trustworthy of those kind of things. But for some reason, God knew what was going to happen during this time. Jesus knew what was going to happen at this very circumstance. He knew the place of where this cult might be, this unridden cult. Now, 
it's really important for us to realize that this is a cult that has never been ridden on. Fowl or mules or donkeys, colts, they're not like their larger brethren. Um, they're not as strong and they're not as they're not as uh, as tough as their larger brethren, their horses or mustangs or uh, any type of steed. How is it that Jesus would take this colt that has never been ridden and then now ride it? That would seem impossible. It's also very dangerous. It's also dangerous for the colt because colts are not as tough or nor as strong as as a horse might be or a camel might be. In fact, uh, they're considered a little bit fragile. Maybe uh, they could be agitated a lot easier. They get very, very uh, scared and uh, they're very apprehensive of even people that they don't know. But next thing we ought to ponder about this passage is who is the owner of this cult? Why would anyone allow this cult who has never been ridden by anybody to all of a sudden be taken away by a stranger and to be ridden? What if this cult is injured? What if this cult injures somebody else? What's going to happen to me? Why in the world would these strangers be allowed to take this cult? But somehow the owners, when they heard the explanation by the disciples, they obliged. Jesus somehow even shows in that moment he is Lord over even creatures and even Lord over our hearts. Somehow this arrangement only seemed temporary though. It was for a very, very short arrangement, for a short stretch of the road. Maybe these owners were thinking, well, let's see if they try, let's see what kind of fool they make, they make themselves out to be by trying this little stunt of theirs. Maybe they thought it was funny. Maybe they'd like to see a spectacle. If they had a cell phone, they'd probably try to tape it and to see if there was uh, an incident that would happen. Something that they could laugh at. But regardless, we don't know the circumstances of what these owners or these, these, uh, these barn keepers were thinking. But we know this for certain, that the arrangement was temporary. Jesus didn't command the, the disciples to go and to purchase a steed or a donkey or a mule or a colt as if it's a long-term investment. No, it's temporary. And that's the thing that we probably have to catch on to in this whole instance, that this is a temporary arrangement. Now, the second... Uh, group of people maybe we want to fix our eyes on the second scene is the crowds of people awaiting Jesus as he enters Jerusalem but what were the crowds saying and what were they thinking the crowds were likely thinking the Messiah is here he's the one who's gonna come and save us from oppression from the Roman Empire and free us uh, to become the kingdom of David once again in fact, verse 9, it says, And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. They expected Jesus to fulfill a prophecy or expectation that somehow he would restore the Davidic kingdom. But what they meant by Hosanna was a sore mistake. That word Hosanna really means save now. And that's the way they put that into context. Many in the crowd recognized Jesus as the son of David who would come to reign again. But they sorely misunderstood the timing and the nature of God's kingdom. They sorely misunderstood who Jesus was. And the kind of Messiah they thought they were waiting for. See, they wanted a Messiah that would resolve and absolve them of all of their daily problems. Political ones. A person who would give them health, wealth, and prosperity. 
one that would restore power once again to Israel, one that would make them feel warm and fuzzy even, to feel secure and to feel taken care of. You know, there's a story that I read uh, in one of our commentaries, and it, it mentioned the story about soldiers from World War II. And during World War II, soldiers would check out books from the library before they go out to war. And they would check them out as a psychological exercise because what would happen is that they would check out these books as a, an almost psychological responsibility of having to return the books after the tour or duty was over. They sought to escape the reality that they might die by thinking they had to return their library books by a certain date. Jesus didn't come to be their library book, their answer to worldly materials. But he came to be much more than that, to solve the problem of death, sin, and eternity for humanity. He came to suffer for all of us, Woody Allen, who I think is one of the greatest directors, movie directors of our time, and is just absolutely genius when it comes to plot and, and script and, and cinematic production, um, he writes in this, in this film or in a script that he wrote for a 1975 film called Love and Death. And in this film, there's a quote that it said, uh, to love is to suffer. To avoid suffering, one must not love. But then one suffers from not loving. Therefore, love is to suffer. What a quote. You know, I really think that humanity, we're, we're so addicted to falling in love. Uh, we love stories of people falling in love. We love movies. We love books about people falling in love. We're so infatuated with this whole idea of falling in love that every, you go to a movie theater and every single movie has at least one element of someone, maybe a character. Most movies have, has an element of romance in it. And without that sense of romance, you would sense that this isn't real human life. That love happens. Even in the midst of turmoil and in the midst of suffering and in the midst of terror, you will even see that even in horror films that there is still some element of love and, and of romance. But I think humanity in many ways were addicted to that very uh, idea of falling in love. The idea of longevity in love and faithfulness and and, and the, the journeying together in love is very rarely depicted in movies and in films and in dramas. When we fall in love, we tend to lie to ourselves just a little bit, just a little bit. And we have to be honest about that today, folks. I think we lie just a little bit when we fall in love. We often see our own image of God or divinity or ideology of what a perfect human being or a perfect deity should be like. Hence why we love and we ignore the all the painful aspects of love and even though we know at some point that this person could possibly, possibly break our hearts or possibly be someone that we get into an argument with or maybe don't see eye to eye with or maybe we see flaws in that person later on down the road. We choose often when we fall in love with people to ignore that very fact. And even ourselves, we try to mask ourselves. We, we show our softer, more lovely side to the people that we love. We omit the part that makes us realize that no one is nearly as perfect as Christ will ever be. True love is then it's not it's it's tested not in merely seeing the divine ideas of people or sides of people, but that we choose to see it even when our own projections of divinity become removed from the whole of reality. There's a difference between love and falling in love. 
See, us Christians have bought into this whole tapestry, this fantasy of falling in love with our faith, even, to falling in love with God. You know, we have, uh, we have worship music saying, I want to fall in love with you, Jesus, again. We have this idea that Christianity is really about falling in love with God again, somehow. That with our religion, with our idea of who we think God should be. And so what we do is we mask and we put this tapestry of, of who we think God should be and then ignore all the facts of who God actually is. We lie to ourselves a little sometimes, even as Christians, as believers. But instead, I think we ought to think about this. Is our own idea of God really who he actually is? Is he really, in my mind, in my heart, is he really who he actually is according to his word? Not according to my thoughts and how I feel or how I perceive the world around me, but rather, do I see God as he is written in his word? And that is an important thing for us to to reflect upon and ask ourselves, do we only want the good and the fuzzy and wonderful feelings of a filtered gospel? One that is filled with merely encouraging words. We love spiritually encouraging words, right? We love words that will say, you know, uh, God will be with you or God is there with you in, uh, in, in times of need. He answers prayers. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. And we say these things quite often. But do we only want the good and fuzzy feelings of a filtered gospel? One that is filled with merely encouraging or softer words? Or are we willing to face the facts of our brokenness, our selfish natures, our sinful thoughts and our actions? Are we willing to face the reality of our faith? Faith is not merely falling in love, friends. It's following in love. And that means it's the journey of discovering who Christ is day by day, no matter our imperfections, no matter our baggage, that we would bring that baggage, that we would bring all those sinful things before him in our weakness and our strength, in our joys and our sorrows. See, the good news is that Christ didn't come to shame us for all the sins and all the things that we find maybe unattractive. But he came to redeem us, to forgive us, and free us from them. But really, in order to get there, to, or in order for us to get to that place in that relationship, there really is only one great obstacle for us as humans, as, as people who call themselves children of God. And that is our willingness to repent, to be redeemed, to be renewed, and to be freed from our sins. We have to be willing Someone who's not willing to be freed, someone who's not willing to be redeemed, someone who's not willing to be renewed, to have change and to have transformation in their life, can really never be. We have to be willing, my friends. See, that's the only real obstacle that we have before us. Are we willing to endure a little bit of humiliation a little, hum a little bit of humility. It's really this, to expect to be in a relationship, a marriage, or even a friendship without dealing with our own shortcomings isn't much of a relationship at all, is it? You can't cruise through a marriage and expect never to confront your shortcomings. You, you will not always see the lovely parts of one another you must be willing to deal with not only the other person's flaws or scars, and maybe that's even the secondary part 
you know, trying to deal with someone else's baggage or someone else's scars or someone else's imperfections. But rather, we have to deal with our own. We must deal with our own. And maybe that's the obstacle in a relationship first. And if we don't see that as a reality in our daily life and we only see that uh, falling in love aspect, we're living in a bubble. And God is saying this to us, I think, today uh, through this passage. We notice that when Jesus comes through uh, Jerusalem, people are praising Jesus because they, they only see what they want to see. They are praising him for what they expect him to be. But how many people are actually willing to deal with what's on the inside? Faith is so much more than just the fuzzy feeling of falling in love with God and feeling good about God. It is the enduring wonder of discovering Jesus of God, of who he is day by day, and it's even enduring in the humiliation and suffering from our sins. After this passage and further down the narrative of, of the gospel, when Jesus is taken away by the Sanhedrin and eventually crucified, the question is how many people, how many of the followers that were there during Jesus' entry into Jerusalem how many were there at the cross? How many were there mourning? How many were there when he was taken down? Everyone wanted to benefit of a savior, but they were never willing to be persecuted for it. Everyone was expecting a political messiah, but nobody wanted to deal with the sin they committed against someone who was rather sinless. Faith, then, is not merely falling in love, friends. It is following in love. It is the journey of discovering who Christ is day by day. In our weakness, in our strengths, in our joys, in our sorrows. Let me repeat that again today. Faith is not merely falling in love. It is following in love. It is the journey of discovering who Christ is day by day in our weakness and strength, in our joys and our sorrows. And so as we begin this Holy Week, as we celebrate Palm Sunday today, let's not forget to think about this very message that faith is not just falling in love, it is following in love. I encourage you that today, I want you to think about that, maybe with your families, with your friends, as you discuss this very topic. And this coming week, um, we hope to be able to send out some devotionals this coming week, and that you would spend time, if you're at home, maybe it's, it's very, very quiet at home for you, that you would somehow find that time to come back to Christ to repent of your sins and to also think about the grace and the love and the wonder of Jesus' forgiveness for you but also the depth of his plan for us as his people that we, you would be blessed by it, transformed by it, moved by it but also that God would also put on your heart his mission his call for you in this life and purpose greater purpose that he has for you each day remember friends that as we close today faith is not merely falling in love it is following in love let's pray as we close heavenly father we thank you uh, for today's message as we hear from you and we um, just remember this very word there are times that, Lord, we have all these expectations. And, Lord, we assume so many things about who you are. Lord, from, from wondering why uh, you would pick a, pick a colt, colt instead of a horse. 
why you would uh, choose uh, to die here on earth instead of live and to reign. Lord Father, we understand and we come to you and say, God, help us to understand more about your grace, about your love, and about your greater plan that is ahead, that you have power over all things, even in, in this time, in this uncertain time of COVID-19 and, and the coronavirus. And sometimes we live in fear and we hope that, Lord, that you would come and, and that you would fix all these problems for us. But Lord, instead, we choose today to lament, to come before you and, and to repent of our brokenness and this chance to come before you and say, Lord, we want to be closer to you. Help us not merely to fall in love today, but Lord, teach us what it means each day to, to follow you, to follow in your footsteps, whether it means to suffer, whether it means that it would point to our inner problems to our flaws, to our scars, that we should need to deal with them for our, in, for, for our inability to reconcile with our neighbor. Maybe it's our inability, O oh Father, to remove prejudice from our hearts, but instead, Lord, wash us clean, or that our hearts may be purified by your Spirit. And Lord, that as we approach Easter, that we be reminded of the grace that is in your Son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that he shed for us. Lord, we thank you for all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, everyone. God bless you. Bye-bye.